this thing on? Okay. I say great minds think alike. That might, must be true because when Polly asked me what songs I wanted to have sung, the first one was uh, Just a Closer Walk with Thee, and the, and the second one was Come to the Fount. So that was going to be our last song. <laughs> and I don't mind if we sing it again. It's my yeah. favorite song. We'll so There's a history behind that. Vicki and I were uh, attending a, a camp meeting, a fine little camp in, up, up north of Spokane, and the guest speaker was uh, uh, missionary Elmer Smelzenbaugh. And he just, he had some, yes, amazing stories that he told about just miracles that happened. Well, at, uh, when he finally sat down, they played Come the Fount, <coughs> Come the Fount, and he came, the whole audience of three or four hundred people, just, it just like the spirit was there. And the testimonies, one, one man stood up and said he was raised in the Nazarene church and heard about sanctification the entire you know, grown up. He's 40 years old, probably. And he said they never believed it until they experienced it. Okay, the cost of my, the title of my sermon is uh, Cost of Discipleship. And I got that from this book right here. It's a book by Diedrich Bonhoeffer. And, uh, well, hmm? right here in class, oh, okay. Yeah, my throat's dry. That happens every time. <laughs> I chose this because uh, I've read this book through, and I, I'm reading it again. And when uh, when pastor asked me two weeks ago if I'd preach, I said I would. Normally, it takes me two weeks to just settle on a, a sermon that I'm going to preach. I had this one before. I had my theme before he asked me to preach because I'd, I'd been rereading this book. So let's open in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. <laughs> Lord, we just thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit that is in this place right now. And we thank you for everyone that has come here today to hear your word. Give us a special blessing, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What's discipleship? What do we think of when you think of discipleship? Being a disciple, right? I uh, went to my Strong's Concordance, which has every word used in the Bible, to look up any verses that had discipleship in them. There isn't any, not one. And the Bible describes discipleship, but the word isn't used. We get the word disciple from the Latin word discipulus, which means student or uh, apprentice can be used. Uh, that's the Latin version of the Greek word mathetes. The word mathetes means student or pupil. And it comes from a verb, manthano, which literally means I am continuing to learn. going to be reading scripture and find it here. scripture I'm reading is Mark 
2.14. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the place of toll, and he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him immediately. Levi was Matthew, the tax collector. He dropped everything he owned and followed Jesus. We think of the disciples as the 12 original disciples, but when we first accept Christ as our Savior, we become a disciple, we be, and he is our teacher. He's our Savior and our Lord, but in the true sense of the word, he's teacher. I've got a, a portion from the book here that Bonhoeffer has written. He says, are those who belong to Jesus only a few, or are they many? He dined on the cross alone, abandoned by his disciples. With him were crucified not two of his followers, but two murderers. They all stood beneath the cross, enemies and believers, doubters and cowards, revilers and de devoted followers. His prayer in that hour and his forgiveness was meant for them all and for all their sins. The mercy and love of God are at work, even in the midst of his enemies. It is the same Jesus Christ who, of his grace, calls us to follow him, and whose grace saves the murderer who mocks him on the cross in his last hour. And if we answer the call to discipleship, where will it lead us? What decisions or partings will it demand? To answer the question, we shall have to go to him, for only he knows the answer. Only Jesus Christ, who bids us to follow him, knows the journey's end. But we do know that it will be a road of boundless mercy. Discipleship means joy. Last week, Alan said that I would be telling a little story. Well, Alan had problems both times that he came back from Georgia, being stranded or breakdowns. Vicki and I were driving back from, from Alaska, from Sterling, Alaska, home, 2,500 miles, and uh, took us six days. Well, the first three days, pretty much no problems. On the fourth day, uh, we were driving between Watson Lake in the Yukon Territory and Fort Nelson in upper British Columbia. And there's a little town about halfway in between, just almost, it, it, uh, exactly in between, and the town sits on a, a lake that's seven and a half miles <coughs> long, but uh, the road past the lake, it was real narrow, it was two lane, but just barely enough for two pars, cars to go by, and the road was between a rock cliff that just dynamited right out of the mountain and the lake right there. Well, Vicky's in behind in a different vehicle we bought there in Alaska, and I'm driving an uh, old Suburban with a heavy trailer behind us. So we're, I'm driving along, and I'm out front, and I just about got past the lake. When I look across the lake and there's a big canyon, all of a sudden there's a big white cloud coming down the canyon. I wondered, what in the world is that? And about that time that cloud hit, it was about a 100 mile an hour wind with snow. They call them willy waws there. And it hits hard enough that it just about brought me to a complete stop. And Vicky's behind me. And uh, just right after that, it, it hits her. And it about blew her up against the side of the mountain. There were rocks flying off the, the mountain down into the road and everything. And she's pretty shook. She hadn't been driving for. Uh, quite some time, six years, he says, because I did most of the driving, but uh, it shakes her up pretty bad, you know, so, but what'd you say? Just as that happened, a uh, song came over our tape deck that said, I will be with you through the storm. So, we still had 154 miles to go from Buncho Lake into Fort Nelson, and uh, it's all mountain pass. You're either going uphill or downhill. 
but we made it into Fort Nelson. Spent the night. The ne next day, we left Fort Nelson, and we were going to stay in Grand Prairie, Alberta. That's about 350 miles. And uh, we made it to Dawson Creek. That's the beginning of the Alaska Highway. And right in Dawson Creek, there's a roundabout where a big pedestal in the middle where you can turn off different streets. Well, I knew that's where I had to, to turn to get on the road to Grand Prairie, but I turned one block too soon. So, and Vicky didn't see me. <laughs> so I whip around the block real quick like that and I got back on the road. Uh, no Vicky. So I headed toward Grand Prairie, and I saw this white pickup with a blue stripe like ours, and I thought, there she is. Drived into a parking lot, it wasn't her. So I go back into downtown Dawson Creek to the RCMP post there. And I went in, and the desk sergeant there, I said, could you send out a trooper if, if you see a white pickup with blue stripe on it, would you stop it? It's my wife. She, we got separated coming through town. Well, they sent a detective in there, hauled me into the interrogation room, and held me there for about a half an hour asking questions like, did you and your wife have a fight? No, no. We just... <laughs> By this time, I'm getting a little frustrated. I just threw my hands up and said, that's it, I'll find her myself, and out the door. So I called up our daughter in, in Sterling, and uh, and Vicky had called her up. So uh, Sarah, our daughter, said, she'll meet you in Grand Prairie. It's about 82 miles. So I drive into Grand Prairie, and I knew the hotel that we were going to stay at was on the, had to turn north. So I pull over in the left turn lane there in Grand Prairie. I look across the intersection, and Vicky's across the intersection. She's in the left turn lane <laughs> going the other direction. Light changes, she takes off. So I whip around the corner and I follow her. And I must have followed her 10, 20 miles or something like that. I don't remember. Couldn't catch up to her. So I turn around, back into Grand Prairie, through the light, and pulled into a, a parking lot by a big mall there, right on the corner. And about that time, I see her, she went right by me again. <laughs> so, so I went to the, the hotel and uh, got us a room, and then went back down to check on her animals in the, in the Suburban. And about that time, she pulls up. She's pretty, pretty nervous. <laughs> hmm? Shook. Shook? Yeah. Shook. So we got through that, and then the next day, we went from Grand Prairie to, uh, we were going to Lake Louise. And we went down to Jasper, turned and filled up again, went and started up over the pass. Two 7,000 foot passes right through the Columbia ice field. We got to the top of the first one. I looked down and the road was just like this. It was about a 10% grade for 25 miles and there was a straight portion on that road. With the trailer behind, I was afraid it was gonna burn the brakes out of the Suburban, if you know, if it went too fast, so I dropped it in low range and first gear, and we crept down the hill. It's raining cats and dogs. We get to the bottom of the hill, and and Vicky says the the spirit had calmed her down by this time. She said, "I'm glad that's over." I said, "I hate to tell you this, but we got another one to go over." <laughs> But we made it into Lake Louise and, and made it home. So,
Bonhoeffer tells us that uh, dis discipleship, the journey is full of mercy, and discipleship is joy. But it can, it can be fraught with troubles as well. You know, have you ever heard the old country western song by Lynn Anderson? I never promised you a rose garden. That can be our walk. Hmm? He told us he'd be there beside us. The You'll be there beside us. I have written here, Bonhoeffer sees a storm brewing, and he writes, Nachtfolge. That's the German name of this, Nachtfolge. It means, literally means the act of following after. And that's basically translated discipleship. And... Uh, I have a book at home, it's called Bonhoeffer, Pastor, Martyr, Prophet, Spy. It was written by Eric McTaxas, it was published in 2010. And in the foreword to that, Timothy Keller writes this. He says, it is impossible to understand Bonhoeffer's Nachtfolge without becoming acquainted with the shocking capitulation of the German church to Hitler in the 1930s. How could the Church of Luther, that great teacher of the gospel, have ever come to such a place? The answer is that the true gospel, summed up by Bonhoeffer as costly grace, had been lost. What's he mean by that? Back to Bonhoeffer. Okay, cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without per personal confession. Cheap grace is without, cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Costly grace is the gospel we must be sought must be sought again and again the gift which must be asked for for the door at which a man must knock such grace is costly because it causes causes us to follow and it and it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ it is costly because it costs a man his life it is costly because it condemns sin and grace because it justifies the sinner above all it is costly because it costs God, the life of his son, you are bought with a price. And what has, <clears throat> what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our life, but delivered him, <clears throat> him up for, cost, for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. A little bit of <clears throat> history of uh, Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer was born in, in Germany in 1906. His father was the leading psycholo psychiatrist and neurologist in Europe, the uh, best known. His oldest brother worked with Albert Einstein and Max Planck splitting the atom, so he was for, Another brother was the head uh, attorney for Lufthansa and uh, Airlines. But Bonhoeffer, at age of 13, uh, was called to be a theologian. Well, you can imagine, um, he was 14 when he told his family. The, the family wasn't real receptive of it. His father kind of did. Uh, but his siblings, his brothers and sisters, just tormented him. The one brother who just, every chance he got, would torment him. And he told the brother, even if you knock my head off, God's still going to exist. And the, the other younger brother would say how bad the church was in Germany. And Bonhoeffer would say, yes, I'm going to 
help it to be revived. So, but uh, he got his doctoral degree, doctorate in theology, at the age of 21, which is just that's unheard of. He came to the United States in 1930 to Union Theological Seminary in, in uh, New York. And we got there and um, saw what was going on there. That He said, there's no theology here. He writes, in New York, they preach about virtually everything. Only one thing is not addressed, or it is addressed so rarely that I have yet been unable to hear it, namely the gospel of Jesus Christ, the cross, sin, and forgiveness, death and life. At this low point in his life, God sent a messenger uh, the messenger was a, a young black student at the seminary named uh, Phillips. And he attended the Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem. And, <clears throat> and Bonhoeffer was so tired of attending the churches where he never heard a word about Jesus. Went to church with, with this black man. And it was the first place, as he says, that it was the first place that he actually heard preaching about the Lord and and saw the effect that that, that uh, the Holy Spirit had on the people just amazed at the uh, the church we've got some of these uh, writing here this is how it affected him In the depth of his misery, Luther, Luther had grasped by faith the free and unconditional forgiveness of all sins. That experience taught him that grace had cost him, very, cost him his very life and must continue to cost him the same price day by day. So far from dispensing him from dis discipleship, that gr this grace only made him more earnest, a more earnest disciple. Another, the disciple simply burns his boats and goes ahead. He is called out and has and has to forsake his old life in order that he may exist. In the strictest sense of the word, the old life is left behind and completely surrendered. When we are called to follow Christ, we are summoned to an exclusive attachment to his person. And he says, Discipleship means adherence to Christ and Christ, and because Christ is the object of that adherence, it must take the form of discipleship. That word adherence in German is, is festhalten. It literally means hold fast or cling to. Discipleship is bound to Christ as the mediator and where it is properly understood, it necessarily implies faith in the Son of God as the mediator, only the mediator, the God-man, could call men to himself. So. What happens when a person uh, that is called chooses to take a different path? Um, Levi Matthew when he was called he, he, he immediately followed Christ but the rich young ruler that uh, came to Christ asked him how do I in, you know reach you know how do I inherit eternal life Jesus said uh, take all you have give it to the poor and follow me and what happened, the rich young ruler wouldn't give up his fortune. He kept his fortune, but he lost his soul at that time. So. And then there's a story of the prodigal son, who basically had everything that he needed, 
but he wanted his inheritance so he could uh, go out and, and do what he wanted to do. The word prodigal means wasteful or reckless, and it's not found in the Bible. The only place it's found is the heading in different <laughs> chapters. Well, I went through that period of the prodigal period. 1968, we moved from Sandpoint to, to Kellogg, where my dad was working down there. And I went to school up through the ninth grade with all the same people. And we got to Kellogg, and I was the outsider. People there didn't, <laughs> the students didn't like me, and they, they made known that they didn't. I ended up in fist fights all the time. So I went my own way. That period lasted 10 years, and I look back on it with just regret and shame. But in 1976, my dad died, and I was so depressed that I couldn't hardly live anymore. And I watched the Billy Graham uh, crusade on TV and, and turned my life back over to the Lord. And, and that's why I'm here today. So, at Bonhoeffer's time, the the church in in Germany had strayed so far from the truth that it was you couldn't recognize it as a Christian church. Christ was not the center of the the state church in in uh, Germany. And because they were, had strayed so far from the gospel, uh, the Nazi regime was literally able to take over the church, and they became the, the, in essence, the the savior of Germany uh, through Adolf Hitler. Well, this book is actually written to combat what was going on in Germany. Uh, Bonhoeffer uh, knew what was going on, knew that the, the Nazis were killing off the Jewish people. His brother-in-law was Jewish. The, his twin sister's husband was Jewish. And uh, so he set out to, to uh, stop the uh, Nazis and made him an enemy and put a target on his back. So, and, uh, but uh, he had a plan. He had uh, a relative, a cousin on his mother's side, w w was the commandant of the Abwehr, which is the, was the German secret service, the intelligence branch of the army. And he was very anti-Nazi. So uh, Bonhoeffer actually joined the Abwehr, the Secret Service, was a member of it. And later on, his critics said that he, he had been a Nazi too. He never was. He was, uh, what he did do was uh, lead intelligence about different battle plans and whatnot, and, and uh, fed them to the, the Allies through an English pastor friend of his. So it didn't stop the, the Nazis, but it slowed them down quite a bit. Uh, and you've heard of the Valkyrie plot, the plot to kill Hitler? He was involved in that. Matter of fact, von Stauffenberg, the guy that carried the bomb, is his cousin on his mom's side. But, but they sent him to prison. They, they caught him. His wife's grandmother made a mistake of uh, telling uh, some Nazi official what he was doing. She's kind of bragging that he was doing that. Well, they threw him in a concentration camp in 1943. And he stayed there till April 9th, 1945. When they, they hung it, they uh, 
they executed him. April 9th, 1945. April 29th, 1945. Partisans captured Mussolini and they took him out and hung him. The next day, Hitler shot himself. And six days after that, the German army capitulated, unconditional surrender. Uh, the Nazi regime that was supposed to last for a thousand years, Hitler said, a thousand year right. This regime will last a thousand years, lasted 12 years. And it only survived Bonhoeffer by a month. So. And what did Bonhoeffer <coughs> think about dying? He knew he was stood a good chance of being executed by uh, by his involvement in the different plots. But this is what he wrote about: it. whether we are young or old makes no difference. What are twenty or thirty or fifty years in the sight of God, and which of us knows how near he or she may already be to the goal, the goal of being with Him? That life only really begins when it ends here on earth. That all that is here is only the prologue before the curtain goes up. This is for the young and old alike to think about. So. When we crossed the border back into Idaho, um, I was happy. That long trip, uh, nerve-wracking trip. We crossed the border. I felt like jumping out of the car and dancing a jig and kissing the ground. Can you imagine the joy we will feel when we stand before the Lord? It doesn't compare. It doesn't compare. So the Nazi regime was allowed to take control mainly through the churches. Uh, people don't realize that, that the Nazis controlled the church that could control the people. And that could have been avoided if people would have uh, really sought out the Lord and followed him and lived a life of discipleship. Well, thank you for coming. And uh, God be with you. And Thank you for listening. Father, be with us this day. Just bless us in a special way, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.